You're listening to the Culinary Garden Show. I'm Alan. And I'm Sarah. And so today's March 20th, which is actually the first day of spring. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, it means that we have an equal amount of daylight and nighttime, and things are going to start growing pretty quickly now. We've had a couple of fantastic days where the weather has been really warm, so we've actually had some opportunity to get out into the gardens that we're involved in and have a good look at how they fared through the winter and start uh, some garden projects, including some major prunings, some tree removal, and yeah, just we are burying some stuff around. Yeah, so maybe let's just give a little short introduction to the gardens that we are involved in, because we have sort of three gardens on the go and we're going to be talking about them quite a bit over the year. So the first one is our culinary garden. So that's behind our restaurant. And that's a garden that we mostly focus on growing food in. Yeah, the, culinary, the garden behind the restaurant is in a small courtyard surrounded on three sides by buildings. And on the south facing side, there's an asphalt, a large asphalt parking lot. So it has a really specific microclimate. It's a very small space, but it's super intensely planted. In that garden, we also have a, a small greenhouse. Yeah, definitely. And we have a few uh, fruit trees as well. And we've been uh, revamping it over the last few years uh, and adding more sort of permanent infrastructure, raised beds, uh, retaining wall, things like that. So that's one of the gardens that we work in. And we're focusing most of our efforts on that because we want to be growing as much food as we can for our restaurant as soon as possible. We can grow sort of, I'd say, three seasons of the year. We try and go for three and a half seasons. And uh, and yeah, that's pretty exciting. So there's lots happening there. And part of that, which isn't really a garden, but for the fourth season of the row of the year, uh, we do quite a bit of indoor gardening. So as an adjunct to our courtyard garden, we have an atrium that's south facing that's part of our restaurant. It's part of the dining room. And in there, we bring in a lot of herbs uh, and overwinter them in pots. And as well, we do some microgreens and we just started doing hydroponic. Indoor growing is an important part in the winter for sure. And uh, the microgreens and the hydroponics are gonna be a fun piece of that. Uh, the microgreens have been going great over the winter as well as growing transplants for the garden. So I've started doing that as well. Do you want to just talk quickly about the other two gardens we're involved in? And then we can talk about things that we did this week. Uh, so another garden that we have is at our home, and that is basically a perennial garden. It's all perennial plants, flowers, shrubs, and we're not so focused on edible there. It's trying to be actually just a really low maintenance garden because we spend so much energy on our garden at the restaurant that I don't really want to spend too much time on that. We have two gardens at home. One of them is a food garden, but True. we put it in last year and you've forgotten about it already. Mm -hmm. So we have about six raised beds at home that we grow food in, mostly for our house. But last year we grew like a inordinate amount of jalapenos there. So we brought a lot of them to the restaurant. Uh, and that's in the back of our house. And in the front of our house is like kind of a food foresty type area, but it's not, I see it through a different lens than Sarah does. There's apple trees, cherry trees. Uh, there's also gooseberries. Right, there's a and mulberry bush. Rhubarb. And so there's a lot of edibles there, but mostly it's like a front yard garden and it's supposed to just look like that. Right. I, I think about it as a garden that I'm growing all the beautiful flowers that I like to grow. And I'm also growing them without thinking about them being edible. Like at home, I can grow things that are poisonous, like monk's head and foxgloves. And I do not grow those here, even though we do grow perennials here, because I do not want any mistakes when people are harvesting. Good. So that's, uh, yeah, it's more of a mixed garden. And then the third garden that we're involved with is the Sackville Community Garden, which is pretty close to our house, so that's really convenient. And that is a community garden that's made up of uh, several beds that people sort of take on for the summer. How many beds are there? I think there's 28. So 28 small, like, raised beds. And then there's also a food forest there. And this year we've added a, sort of a large growing area that will have like row gardens in it. 
Yeah, the interesting thing about the community garden here is that it does have several of those food forest and perennial areas that have been planted over the years. And in the last sort of four years that we've been involved, we've been helping uh, get them reestablished, trying to get them to a point where they don't take quite as much maintenance and where they can uh, be producing food and then also attracting pollinators and habitat because it's in a pretty wild part of Sackville where there's a lot of like adjacent fields and there's a lot of bird life and animal life that Mosquitoes. goes through there. Mosquitoes. There's and a lot of mosquitoes. There's a lot of mosquitoes, yeah. Sackville's built on a mosquito swamp. But that's actually a great reason that we try and get a lot of the community garden perennial work done in the next sort of two months. And then we take a break in the summer because it gets pretty intense down there and then uh, do some more work in the fall. So now that we have wrapped up uh, which gardens we're involved in, we can talk about what we got up to this week. It was so nice to go outside and do some outdoor work. Oh my gosh, to put on my work pants and gloves and get out the tools and just start uh, puttering away and seeing what needs to be done. Yeah, and cutting down trees. Yeah, so the first thing we did was actually take down some trees uh, at the culinary garden because they were planted in spots that were too uh, too good for raised beds, basically. We didn't need more trees. We talked about this on a previous show. So making hard decisions about what you want to get out of your garden. And then uh, sometimes there's uh, perennial shrubs or trees planted in places that you don't want them. When we first started to garden here, the back courtyard, which is now an extensive garden, was just a place where people parked cars. There wasn't much back there at all. When we started to plant it, we found a listing on Kijiji where someone who had just recently planted an orchard the year before um, went through a divorce and wanted to get rid of all of their apple trees um, because they reminded them of their husband who they no longer wanted to be reminded of. So they had a listing. If you could go down there and dig up these trees, uh, you could have them for 10 bucks. So we went down and we dug up 10 of these apple trees and they were dwarf, Fuji, and um, Honeycrisp, which is like, this was a serious orchard. And we got 10 of them. They had a lot more, but that's how many we could fit in the van. And we planted them around the property, uh, not knowing where the, what we would be doing in the future with certain areas. So most of them, well, six, or so just over half, were planted against a brick wall of the building next to us. And those have been formed into an espalier, which is basically a two-dimensional apple tree that's carved... Uh, every year is the huge trimming project to like take away all the growth and like it's mostly Honeycrisp apples and those apples are really vigorous growers so it's a lot of pruning every year and then the other apple trees were randomly just sort of plopped down in the garden and it ended up that we put them in spots that are sunny spots and because we're surrounded on three sides by buildings we don't have a lot of really sunny areas and that's where vegetables and greens grow best. So we really wanted to take those back. The trees are now over 10 years old, so they are too big to move. And we didn't really have any spaces for them. So those trees, we took two of those trees down. And we also took down two viburnum trees. Right. The viburnum trees were ones that uh, somebody gave me that are a beautiful native shrub. They're viburnum lantana. There's a lot of different kinds of viburnums that you might see, like high bush cranberry. Uh, but they are, I mean, the berries are technically edible, but I don't think they taste very good. And they were just sort of planted as, you know, a, a part of a naturalized uh, area. But we're going to put a compost system there. And a compost system is a lot higher value than a couple of, you know, nice flowering shrubs. So I'm just like the kind of person who is, if I'm going to plant a tree, I want it to be a fruit bearing tree. That philosophy has been changing over the years because apple trees are a huge amount of work to get any sort of viable fruit out of it. Last year was sort of the last straw. It was the darkest year, as in how much, how little sunlight there was and how much cloud cover there was in the Maritimes in like, I think 60 years, or it was 80 years since yeah, records have been it's started. Pretty amazing. So it was like, it was kind of like the Lord of the Rings, like where like the, you know, the bad people take over and everything turns dark. Yeah, That's what and, it was and, like last summer. And I mean, we didn't even have like, you know, a lot of places had like wildfire smoke, which is something else that can knock out the sun and really. Yeah, we didn't get a lot of that, but all of this darkness and then a lot of rain, it basically rains every week. 
so what ends up happening is that every insect and mold and disease that can attack an apple basically attack the apples. They were just rotting, disgusting, pulpy masses <laughs> on the trees. And there wasn't anything I, we could do about it because normally we would try to combat those insects by using sprays that are organic sprays like BTK or neem oil, but you can't apply a spray to a tree if it's going to rain two days later because it's just going to wash your application off. Yeah. So there was nothing we could do and we just had like all kinds of rotten apples and it's a lot of work to get to that stage. So with an apple tree, you start by pruning it in the spring and then you get your bud and your fruit set and then you have to go and you have to pick a bunch of the fruit off because you only want really one apple every six inches and that's a lot of work on these prolific trees just to have them all rot. And even if you do have a really good year, you're getting like a couple of bushels of apples. So it seems like a huge amount of work and it's blocking out sun from reaching the things that you're trying to grow below them. And, and, and that's a really good point. It's like, it's always a consideration. You know, you can grow so many different kinds of plants in our climate uh, and so many different kinds of edible plants, but really trying to be specific about, you know, what are crops that you want that are high value. Apples are also really cheap and people grow them really effectively all over the place. So like, we don't need to grow our own apples. But the amount of work that goes into a, an, a large, unblemished, organic a uh, honey crisp apple like those go for 2 to 3 dollars a piece in the fall and they probably should be worth about 10 dollars each they're just like it's so hard to organically grow those kinds of apples they take a lot of inputs and they need a lot of really good weather and a lot of people need to work on those apples need to be in the orchards and taking care of them it's kind of amazing but it's beyond the scope of what I'm able to do as a chef and a gardener. So I'm going to leave it to the professional orchardists. And and I think that gardening really makes me respect all the professional growers so much because you know how hard it is to be getting a, a little bit of a crop out of something. You know, the huge amount of specialized knowledge that goes into it and the huge amount of work. It's, it's amazing. Yes, absolutely. So we offed all these trees and now we're going to have a lot more yeah. sunlight hitting our it, vegetables. It was a pretty satisfying process. It was interesting because we were like, okay, how do we take them down? And we just took like hand pruners and just clipped all the small branches and just dropped them on the ground so they can just decompose as mulch and then took, you know, various size pruners and then uh, just chopped all the wood up. And I mean, the great thing about that apple wood is that we can use it in the smoker and the barbecue. So, you know, we've got a good supply of, of apple wood to use for the year, which is nice. It's not going to go to waste. And yeah. Yeah. Having those little tiny bits, all those little butt ends and stuff like that fall down into the garden below is really healthy for the garden. Those little bits of wood, especially the small, not like the big, like chipped hunks of wood, but the little, uh, I can't remember the name of that type of wood, but it's, um, anyway, in a lot of the orchard books, I, 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 I've read the organic orchard books over the years. It's like those little bud ends are really good for other apple trees in the area. So you just want to let that stuff mm -hmm. fall on the ground and keep it around. Interesting. And then you used a chainsaw actually to take down the biggest part of the trunk. Yeah, because it was pretty big. Like these were, I don't know, they were just sort of whips when we got them, which is just sort of like a stick sticking up. And that was in 20... Probably 2014, 2013? 2013, I would say. Yeah. So, they're, so they were probably a year old or two years old, and then we've had them for almost 10 years. So yeah. That's, you know, getting big and they were doing really well back there. The first winter we had them, we had so much snow in the backyard that uh, it was like basically a whole story worth of snow collected and the trees got really, really badly damaged, but they all survived. But now they're not there, most of them. Yeah. And the other thing... The other thing that we did is we moved a couple of bushes. So we had some Hascap bushes and we cut those down to about seven or eight inches off the ground, cut back all the branches and then uh, dug them up, uh, keeping as much of the roots as we could. And then we moved those to our home garden. So they're sort of now part of a hedgerow that goes along the road. So 
They are going to have a new life, which is great. They're going to keep me from having to see my neighbors. Exactly, yes. Which is a nice thing for a bush to do. Hascaps, we're really excited about those. There's so much like information and talk about how they're like such a great uh, bush, uh, fruit-bearing bush. And they're actually from Japan, I believe you. Wasn't nope. It? Hascaps what? are a kind of honeysuckle. And they're right. actually originally from Russia. like Northern Europe and Russia. Right. I was getting that confused with Forsythia. That was the one but that we found But then Japan actually was the first place to then take and start breeding Hascaps. And the name Hascap actually comes from a Japanese word. And they started doing that in the 1960s and 70s. Right. And then like in, uh, you know, the rural magazine that we get and other sort of gardening things, like uh, people talk about it. They're very excited about Hascaps, but they take up a lot of room and... They often produced a lot of flowers, but not a lot of fruit. And, the and I birds think, got the fruit. I think why people like them also is that they grow in areas that are like colder and windy and maybe like they're very popular in Quebec and in the prairies or they have even shorter growing seasons that we have now. But I mean, we've got a pretty good little microclimate back there. We don't need to grow those ultra tough cold season crops like we can get away with growing uh, currants and raspberries and blackberries and other things. So what Hascap is good for around here is it's an early bloomer and the bees and other like pollinator insects love it. Yeah. So I'm happy that they'll, they'll grow back at home. And when you are cutting back a, a bush like that to move, this is an okay time to move things because they're still dormant. Uh, you can just cut it back and you want to sort of have an equal amount above ground as you do below ground. So you don't want to move a huge bush with only a small amount of roots. You want to make sure that you uh, cut back the top so the roots have a chance to be able to support that upper growth when it happens. Yeah, and it's a multi-stem, multi-trunk, bushy, sort of tall, almost six foot tall, large bush and we just cut it down to about six inches above the ground which is pretty harsh but this is a harsh movement we're doing here so we cut the top off and then the soil was even a little bit frozen in in some spots around it cut around it lifted it up put it in some rubber made containers drug it home and then planted it in very cold soil it's not aware what happened to it yet <laughs> it will find out soon it will find out next week <laughs> yeah so we've had pretty good spring weather, and it seems like the spring weather is happening even a little bit earlier than usual. I just was seeing a story in the CBC that was marking where uh, it said in Moncton, we're 2.7 degrees warmer than we usually are this time of year, and in Halifax, 1.7, so a little bit less. Probably the ocean tempers that a bit. Mm -hmm. But they're documenting very closely how, you know, we've been hearing for years and years and years, like, it's going to be this much warmer and this much warmer, and the temperature's going to go up, and now it's like, okay, there you go. And so things are starting to bloom a little bit earlier as well. Like, I saw the first crocus bloom in our yard for the first time uh, two days ago when we were doing that work. And that's a lot earlier than April 1st when I usually see them. Yeah, there's a couple of other things in our yard at home that are have flowers on them. Yeah, we have some heather bushes that have flowers. I mean, once the snow melted, the heather bushes were there and they were already in flower. Uh, it's pretty amazing. And then the other thing we have is a hellebore. So that's a poisonous plant. That's why I grow that one at home. Uh, and that's uh, a plant that actually will be flowering all winter in some gardens. So anytime that day gets warm enough, it sort of has these flower buds that just sit there and can resist freezing. And then if it gets some sun and warm temperatures for a couple of days, they'll open up. They're pretty incredible. Yeah. And then there's like some Johnny jump up flowers around. Yeah. Johnny jump ups will flower again. It's like all they need is a couple of days that are warm and they'll pop right open. Yeah. And the colt's foot is out. That's always the first wildflower that I notice. Uh, it's Hardly a little wildflower. It's just like a little tiny dots of yellow that usually grow in like gravelly areas and sort of like sides of roads. It sort of grows in the most marginal uh, of conditions, but it's nice to see just like a little bit of another color. Yeah, that's like the false dandelion. Exactly. Yeah, it's a harbinger of all the things to come and it. It flowers before the leaves come out. So, And not exactly garden related, like in Sackville, which is sort of a bird fly through area, we, we're starting to see the spring, the spring birds return. So we had like the morning doves, which are, I think are maybe around all year round, but like they started nesting and hanging out on the power lines again. 
And we also saw grackles for the first time, which is a sign of spring. The robins are around en masse. And yeah, lots of nature activity. The other thing that's really interesting is that the birds are starting to sing again. So even like yesterday, it snowed for a while, but as I'm walking in the snow, I can hear the birds chirping. And something I learned this year that is uh, really interesting is that birds like chickadees, for example, they have really small brains and they sing with their brains and speak all summer long. And then in the late fall, uh, they start to hide seeds and they use the vocalizing part of their brain to remember where seeds are and stop singing. So they only have enough room in there for either talking or remembering where the seeds are. I feel like that some days. (laughs) Who doesn't? (laughs) So yeah, speaking of seeds, this is definitely seed starting time. And there's a bunch of different uh, Seedy Saturday events coming up. Uh, and that's that's pretty exciting. So Seedy Saturday is an uh, event that's organized by different community groups all over the country. And then it's sort of promoted by a group called Seeds of Diversity. Do you remember a really long time ago in Halifax, we got that catalog that was all like seed swaps? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So they, for a long time, I, I'm sure it still happens online. I haven't looked it up, but they would have this catalog that you could order and it was all just people offering up heirloom varieties of seeds that they were growing out. And they'd say, send $2 in an envelope to, you know, Joe Blow in uh, Saskatoon and he'll send you them back. So it was a pretty cool way of uh, sort of having a community driven seed, uh, seed library happening. And these CD Saturdays happen all over the country. All over the country. Yeah, there are CD Saturdays. And there's a few happening in the local area that I can just plug quickly. Um, Around the Halifax area, I think there have already been a couple of CD Saturdays. But coming up on Saturday, March 23rd, the St. Margaret's Bay Garden Club is having one. And then on Sunday, March 24th, the Muscadabit Harbor Harbor. The Muscadabit Harbor Farmer's Market is having a CD Saturday as well. So it's often garden clubs or farmer's markets that sort of add this on to their events that are already going on. And then uh, on Saturday, April 6th in Amherst, Nova Scotia, there's going to be a CD Saturday. And that one's pretty big. There's usually quite a few seed vendors and some other activities. And then we're going to have one here at our restaurant, Ducks Aren't Real, and that's on Bridge Street in Sackville, New Brunswick. And that's going to be on Saturday, March 30th from 11 till 1. And that's just going to be a fun seed swap event. Everybody has so many seeds, so many older seeds. I mean, when you get a seed package, you usually end up with way more than you need. And also, if you save seeds from your garden, you end up with a lot I'm literally looking at a giant container of milkweed seeds right now that's up on the shelf. So there are a lot of seeds in our lives, and it's great to be able to just share them with other people. And also just CD Saturdays are a great way just to meet other gardeners and get tips and ask questions and just nerd out about gardening for a while. And complain about the weather. Yeah, I mean, of course. Equal parts complaining and talking about how excited you are. (laughs) Everyone's excited at this time of year. Yeah, this time of year is great because nothing has gone that wrong yet. And gardens (laughs) are so just full of like hope and optimism. And I love it. I just love the the forward thinkingness of this time of year. I'm like, all right, I'm not going to make any of the mistakes I made last year. The weather's going to be totally perfect and everything's going to grow super well. Full of hope and optimism. Exactly. But hope is not a strategy. So, you know, it's also a really important time to be planning for how we're going to make this year better than last year. That's true. So looking at what grew, what didn't grow, uh, reviewing some of those some of those plans. And and yeah, that's like a process that we're we're doing ongoing. Another thing to watch out for in the community is uh, community garden registration. So we talked about how we're uh, part of the community garden here in Sackville and the registrations for those plots goes out this week. So if you don't have anywhere to garden at your home, or even if you do have somewhere to garden at your home, but you want to try, uh, try out a garden plot, then now is a great time to get in touch because there's a limited number and they do go within a couple of weeks. So you can send an email to the community garden, look it up on the online and, and then get all the information that you need. 
And there's more and more community gardens all the time. Uh, if there hasn't been one in your community, there may be one that started over the last couple of years. So it's good to check and see uh, if you can find one. And I think that one thing that I would just say is like spending a lot of time uh, lately sort of on the internet, like social media, YouTube, there's so many garden videos out there that uh, try to like trick, like they, they use the clickbait and they use a lot of like sort of negativity and fear mongering to try to get you to like click on their videos, like six ways to ruin your right. garden. Don't make this mistake. Yeah, don't do this. And it's like, yeah. actually, we've been doing this as human beings since we've been sort of like modern homo sapiens sapiens. Uh, it comes naturally to us. It's a lot of fun. You can't really do anything wrong. It's really hard to hurt someone. Um, and it's just like such a joyful, great thing to do that it's really too bad that people are trying to like, uh, you know, I guess like enrich themselves or try to get more views through sort of pushing some sort of like challenging aspects or negativity. I mean, certainly the more you get into gardening and the more small fails you have, um, you're going to want to figure out how to solve those problems. Mm -hmm. But growing a tomato or just go, go into your fridge or your pantry and find something that has seeds in it and just like germinate those seeds, throw them in the window totally. in a little pot of dirt and grow it for a little while and like then throw it in the garbage. <laughs> A gardening also, I find, is such a broad term. It's like, what is gardening? Like, gardening's planting some petunias outside your house. Gardening's growing a giant vegetable garden. You know, gardening's planting trees. It's like all kinds of different things. So whatever piece of it you're interested in is the best. And I think that, yeah, that's a good point about garden information getting very overwhelming. And, and I think that's why these kinds of garden events are really great. And what we've been trying to do at the community garden is just getting people together to talk about their gardening successes and, you know, troubles that they're having. The best thing that you can learn is, you know, not from a Facebook group or a YouTube video, but it's from your neighbors who like garden in areas where the conditions are the same. And, you know, that's also the best way to build up a really awesome garden and perennial garden is to like get plants from neighbors and and from other people in your community so there's a real like richness of knowledge there that is just waiting if you're thinking about starting to garden or starting a garden and you're hesitant just go find some gardeners and you will no longer be hesitant about it they will just tell you that it's a great thing to do and give you lot, loads of advice and positive reinforcements and help you start your culinary garden adventure. Yeah. So that's a great way to end this week's show. So thanks, everybody, and we'll... See you next week.